Hi guys, so I don't know how this is going to um, go exactly, but I'm here to do my end of month reading wrap up for, what is this month? August, it was actually September. Um, but I'm just doing it sitting on my sofa to be honest because I have been so run down the past few days, like I spent a whole weekend in bed and now I'm up and I'm doing things because I do have work to do that just needs to be done. Lucky for me, I have the luxury from working from home, uh, but I also wanted to film this wrap up because I wasn't sure when else I'd get a chance to do it, but honestly, the thought of sitting on a metal backed chair <laughs> and actually doing the setup properly was just not happening, okay? So this is what's happening instead and I'm sure it'll be just as good because I'll, I'll think the exact same things about all the books that I read regardless of where I'm sitting. So yeah, I'm going to review for you the books I've read in the second half of August. Again, really struggling with the months here. <laughs> um, which is quite a few actually, I think, between the Femme Fan Tale Readathon and actually being ill and listening to a ton of audiobooks in bed, I've ended up reading quite a lot. So I guess I should just jump straight in. I will start with the graphic novels. So the first graphic novel I have to show you is When I Arrived at the Castle by Emily Carroll. Um, I'll find a non-indecent spread for you because some of them are quite explicit. Um, this is what it looks like inside. It's quite typical of Emily Carroll's style. If you have read like Through the Woods or some of her shorter comic books, she uh, writes and draws these beautifully dark, gothic and quite violent graphic novels. I guess this would fall into kind of like horror fairy tale genre. That's a genre. I've made it a genre now. I mean fairy tales are actually quite gruesome anyway. So it really goes in for that gruesomeness of, of a fairy tale. Um, but it's also quite subversive and unique. Uh, oh, that is like... I also don't want to spoil anything, but here, here's a good spread. Um, really loads of blacks, whites and reds. That's typical again of Emily Carroll. Love them and really, really enjoyed this comic book. There's not much I can say without spoiling the book because it is very short. It's basically about a cat girl who goes to this strange gothic manor where a woman lives seemingly perhaps like a kind of vampire woman or a shapeshifter but some sort of weird witchy woman um, and there's, they seem to have a pre-existing relationship and she's sort of like oh you've returned now why have you come back and um, it's kind of unraveling that story and all the little fairy tale elements in it uh, there's also quite a lot of like female female sexual tension and I don't know, it, they're just fabulous. I really like Ellie Carroll and I just grow to like her more and more the more I read and this I think is an excellent example, it's her latest work and I can't wait to see what she does next. But I actually read another graphic novel illus illustrated by Emily Carroll, which is Baba Yaga's Assistant. This one is not written by Emily Carroll though, it's written by Marika Mikula. And it's based on Russian folklore about Baba Yaga, if you've heard of Baba Yaga. She's like a sort of Russian folklore type witch who eats children and rides around in a mortar and pestle and has a house with chickens like, you know, there's lots of fairy tales and folk tales surrounding Baba Yaga. And this is about a young girl, I'm not sure exactly how old she is, she looks like she's either preteen or teenage, she's not like super young who's lost her mother and her grandmother, so now it's just her and her father, but her father has remarried, or is about to remarry, giving her a younger sister, and she just feels like a little bit rejected by her father, like she wasn't enough, she wasn't good enough, and he hasn't given her the love that she needed since um, all of the other people in her life have passed away, so she decides to go and seek out Baba Yaga and become her assistant. And it's a lot of fun, it's very different in tone to this, although they both draw on fairy tales and of course this is written by somebody else, um, but just so that you're aware, this is far more, I would say, middle grade young adult, whereas the other book that I just showed you is very adult. This is not, this this could be read very much by any age, it's got some nice messages, um, obviously it deals with grief. I liked it, I'm not like hardcore in love with it. I prefer Emily Carroll's drawing style in these other books by her, they're just more to my taste, that kind of stylized horror type graphic novel, whereas these are cute. And there's a slightly different style used occasionally when it refers back to kind of fairy tales that the character is remembering and I particularly like the style for these 
these fairy tale sections, although the book itself could be a fairy tale. I enjoyed it, it's cute. I got it at the library, probably wouldn't have bought it myself, but you know, was happy enough to read it. And then lastly for graphic novels, I read one during the Femme Fantail Readathon, which was the readathon I hosted, and that was the Tea Dragon Society by Katie O'Neill, and I loved this. This is my favourite graphic novel I've read all month. It's my favourite graphic novel I've read in a while. It's so cute and it is just that it is very much cute like cute is the main word i can use to describe it so maybe it's not gonna be everybody's favorite graphic novel because they're not looking for cute but wow did i love it and i love the illustration style it's my second katie o'neill i've also read aquacorn cove which again was an excellent example of her her art i think her art is beautiful this is a children's middle grade graphic novel can be read by all ages i wanted to uh you know print out and cut out all of the images and stick them on my walls because they're beautiful. I actually read this one for free because I didn't know this but somebody told me in the comments of one of my videos it's actually available on Katie O'Neill's website. So it was originally an online comic and you can still read it on her website or of course you can purchase it and read it um, if, if that's something you're interested in and since then there's been a sequel which I have got in a review copy of so it's not free online but I've got a review copy of it so I'm really looking forward to reading the sequel but it's set in a kind of magical world where we, where we follow a little girl who is the daughter of a blacksmith and she's training up to be a blacksmith in, in her mother's tradition and she comes across this little dragon in an alleyway that needs her help and it's a tea dragon and she takes a little tea dragon back to its owner who runs this tea shop where they like collect the tea from dragons. So these are little dragons that grow plants from their heads like jasmine or chamomile and they harvest that to make tea and it's a very special kind of magical tea that helps you remember things as well as experience other people's memories and it's just a lovely, lovely story. It is for children, so you know that take that for what you will. But it is well done, and I don't always enjoy it, children's literature as an adult um, because it just doesn't always give me the meat that I need. But um, <laughs> says the vegetarian. But I love this book. It was so beautiful, so cute. Cannot wait to read the sequel. You know, for me, this just ticked all my boxes. I thought I would like it, and I did. It was exactly why I expected it to be. I then read a non-fiction book that I'm only going to talk about briefly here because it needs a whole video, you know, there's a lot to say on it and I just don't think I can discuss it in justice in a wrap-up video and that is This Is Not A Drill. This is the Extinction Rebellion handbook, so it doesn't have one author, it's actually um, a collective effort by many different people who have contributed to it, like Mohammed Nasheed who was the president of the Maldives, we've got some of the original um, founders of the Extinction Rebellion movement and organisation, we've got politicians from the United Kingdom and people from all across the um, world really. Real diverse selection of people saying a real diverse selection of things. So there are pros and cons to this book. If you're not familiar, Extinction, Rebe Extinction Rebellion are an organisation that are fighting against climate change. They're trying to bring the kind of climate catastrophe to the attention of the mass media and to people that aren't as aware of it um, to, you know, force big companies and governments, those that really hold the power to make large changes and commit to changes um, to for a more sustainable, climate-friendly future because otherwise we're screwed. <laughs> This is not a drill, as the title says. <laughs> and um, I think the book as a whole is fantastic and I personally would encourage all of you to pick up a copy, to order it into your library if your library doesn't already have it, to, you know, chip in with friends and buy a copy together and then share it amongst yourselves. Like, this, I think, is a really, really important book. I do think, in some ways, it's maybe lacking, you know, it can't cover everything in other respects because it's got various different contributors talking about different things. I don't think they always gave as much detail or perhaps address things as directly as I would have liked them to. There was one essay in particular called Courting Arrest, which is about getting arrested during um, political activism, which I don't think is, is necessarily a bad thing and um, it's been used to great effect in the past by various different people throughout history, but I think that it was a slight romanticisation in that essay that I wasn't a big fan of. Um, however, I do think there's overall a tone of like, 
you know, there's a tone of this is not a drill and this needs to be dealt with immediately and it's not about just, you know, giving up plastic straws, it's about more than that, it's about changing our entire world and our systems and um, actually addressing capitalism as a major contributor towards this problem because it's that constant need to create more things and buy more things and, and for profit and that is what leads to a lot of our problems. I mean, fast fashion is the second largest contributor to climate change. So. It is an immediate thing, but I also felt like this book is a practical book, like, in, in, because it's practical, it's hopeful, because it's about what can we all do, we can get together, we can do this, we can demand for change, we can, uh, you know, make people more aware of things and we can, you know, like, actually, you know, shout about it and not just give up and sit in our houses until the world kind of explodes or melts or whatever it's going to do, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> but yeah, so like, generally speaking, I don't think this is an actually really depressing book, I think it's a I need to change book, um, and, it, and it might, you know, be quite a confronting book, but it's not a depressing book because it's also a, you know, humans, we need to take care of our planet and take care of each other and, you know, deal with this. So why not? I, again, think everyone should really read this for whatever it's worth and I will do a whole video on it, I think. So what else did I read during the Femme Fantail Readathon though? If you saw my vlog, you will have seen me talk about some of those books. I will link the vlog down below. Uh, one of those was Red Ropes of Fate, which I listened to an audiobook of on Scribd. This was just like a cute little fantasy of manners type fantasy romance book, not an explicit like adult romance by any means. Just like a cute fantasy of manners and it's about a elf and a human who are bonded so this is in a world where elves and humans cannot really speak each other's languages like the it's so difficult only a few trained people have managed and they are specialists in it and even then they can only communicate certain things you know that's just the magical backdrop of this world um but they do use these magical spells to bond kind of aristocratic elves and humans in order for them to sort of like keep the ties between their their people and it's not bonded in a romantic sense it's not like a marriage it's more of a friendship however naturally our human and our elf end up developing feelings for each other and it's very cute and it's just about their budding relationship there are people in their world that don't want their relationship to kind of blossom um who are suspicious of it and what it might mean for their people on both sides of the, the spectrum whether they be elf or human and that sets up some roadblocks for them but it is very much just like cute little kind of like if, if as if mr darcy and elizabeth bennett were an elf and a um human one of them is a human but you know what i mean it was cute i really enjoyed it it was the exact kind of palette cleanse i was in the mood for when i read it and if it sounds like your cup of tea i think it's a great example of that kind of literature and you will probably enjoy it i also read honor among orcs by amelia dillon this is another fantasy romance although like more heavy on the romance and this one's between a human and an orc so not a human and elf, a human and an orc. And it is about a princess uh, whose father is incredibly abusive, so he's the king of this world. Fair warning, there's a lot of abuse in this book, particularly at the beginning. Her father is very abusive, as well as one of the noblemen in the court who's uh, implied as being sexually abusive towards her. And she's naturally desperate for freedom. One day when she's hiding from this nobleman, she comes across an orc being kept prisoner in her father's palace. And together they sort of like create a unlikely friendship and plot their escape from the palace. And I've already said this is a romance, so naturally the the bond they develop is more than one of friendship. It becomes a romantic one along the way, and I really enjoy the romantic aspect of their relationship. I like the respect that they had for one another, and I just thought it was a really nice romance despite all the darkness in the background of their lives and particularly her life in the beginning that you get to experience. I read this because it is marketed, I want to say marketed because that makes it sound like it was the author, but online it's listed as a Beauty and the Beast retelling on Goodreads and I love a Beauty and the Beast retelling. It's not really <laughs> a Beauty and the Beast retelling. I mean I guess, you know, she ends up with the beast because he's an orc. It is, I don't see how it follows that fairy tale storyline at all really. <laughs> so. I would disregard that if you've seen it marketed as that. But it's a fantasy fairy tale esque romance between these two very different people who like find solace in one another, and I really enjoyed that. 
I did find sort of particular in the middle section it got a bit confusing like there was some jumps in the narrative which fair enough were to create tension and move the plot along but I didn't think <laughs> they necessarily were clear at the time what was going on or why they were going on or how we got to where we were getting and it kind of became clearer later but it didn't feel unclear in the sense that this is a mystery that I want to find out the answer to it just felt like it wasn't explained at the time and I just sort of pieced it together as we went along however I will probably read the sequel I think it's a duology it's definitely the first in a series and I would like to see what happens next for our two main characters because I really like them and I'm invest invested in their story even if I think there was a little bit of work to be done in the actual storytelling. So you know, it is what it is. Um, I also finished Seer of Seven Waters, which if we're going to talk about disappointing books, I think I'm more disappointed in this book in particular because I love the author, Juliette Marillier. I love this series, which is a Seven Waters series. I've given every other book in it five stars, and this one I gave three stars. So my expectations oh, were high, but they were not met, unfortunately. This is my least favourite book of this series so far. It's book five. Each book follows an independent storyline centred on one of the female members of this family, the Seven Wars family that are a sort of aristocratic family in medieval Ireland, where we also have the fair folk and druids and elements of magic and always a romance. Like there's always a romance in these books, uh, as well as like an exciting journey to follow our female protagonist on as she like does some amazing stuff and they, I like always love the female protagonist so much. However, with this book, I think I've figured out exactly what I think doesn't work about it. It doesn't feel like it's about the main character. So the main character is Shabelle, a member of this family, the Seven Morris family, and she has been training to be a druid and join the druid communities and, you know, like live a life of celibacy, dedicated to the gods. And she's been sent away to Swan Island for a short time to stay with her sisters and their husbands and, you know, just get a little bit of a feel for the world before she commits to this life. Naturally, however, while she's there, she meets a young man. So he and some other characters are shipwrecked on Swan Island. His name is Felix. And unlike any of the other books in the series, we also get his perspective. So all the other books in the Seven Wars series have been from the perspective of the women alone. This one is from the perspective of Shabelle and Felix, which I didn't really enjoy that much. Like, I didn't really care what Felix had to say. I don't think it really added anything to the book. But then again, I just overall was just a little bit disinterested in their romance because for me, the central storyline of this book is about these two men and this one woman who are shipwrecked on Swan Island and the mystery of what happened to them because Felix can't remember, he's got amnesia, the other guy uh, doesn't seem to be telling all the truth and the woman is mute so can't communicate verbally. Therefore, lots of mystery surrounding that and actually I felt like the crux of the story was happening to this mute woman. So the mute woman is called Svala and I genuinely felt like the story was Svala's story, but instead we were just seeing it from Shabelle and Felix's perspective and they were more interested in like fighting their feelings for one another than actually, you know, what was happening to Svala. And it was definitely Svala's story, whereas in all the other books I feel like um, the main character has been the main character, if that makes sense. You know, book one was about Sorcha and her journey and her adventure and what was happening to her and her role in it. This book was about Svala, just told from the perspective of Shabelle and Felix, and I don't think that that was the author's intention, but I think that's what annoyed me. I think there wasn't actually enough storyline attached to Shabelle, and for that reason, it just never really got going, even when the pace picked up, because these are always slow books, and I'm okay with them being slow, because they're slow, but things are still happening. However, this was slow, and even when it felt like things should be happening, it didn't. I don't know, like I don't know how to explain it and I'm more critical of it because I love the other books in the series because I didn't hate it. It's not the worst fantasy book I've ever read and I'm definitely reading the next book in the series. I was just disappointed because I love her other books so 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 much um, and therefore I hold it to extra high standards. What can I say? So maybe a, a three star Juliet Merlier is probably still like a four star for most other fantasy authors from me but I expect 
good things and this one just you know was met it was like a bit of a drop in the series for me I could have gone without it however I am excited to read the sixth book which is the final book in this series because it is my favourite series of all time and I have every intention of doing a whole video dedicated to the Seven Wars books once I've read book six so please do not take this as discouragement to read Daughter of the Forest which is book one because they are so phenomenal and I'm just being tetchy because I had such high hopes and it was just an okay book. I was then not expecting to have any more books to review for you this month, but I actually have four. <laughs> because I listened to four audiobooks in the space of three days when I was in bed sick. <laughs> and they were all historical romance books by Tessa Dare. And I am so glad for their company whilst I've been ill because they have got me through. I don't think I would have been able to concentrate on anything heavier and they were the perfect fun escapism. I started reading Tessa Dare a few months ago on the recommendation of Amanda from the Naughty Librarian and I'm so glad that I did because I adore her books. They're all historical romances and my favourite thing about all of them is the female protagonists because they're always so fierce, so witty, so, you know, clever, strong personalities even if sometimes you know they have their anxieties and their insecurities but you know they have like these sound secure personalities that come across in the writing of the stories. I also just realised that I didn't read four in August or three because one of them I finished yesterday and it's September and it was September yesterday. So I'm not going to mention the one that I finished in September, I will mention that in my September wrap up. So the three Tess Adair books that I read in August were all in the same series and they were The Duchess Deal, The Governess Game and The Wallflower Wager which is actually Tess Adair's most recent book. And they are all in the Girl Meets Duke series which there will be four books in so there's one more book to come out. And each book follows a different member of this friendship group so each book follows a different lady who is one of four friends. So in that sense they're all tied together and they are a series, however each is its own standalone story. I can promise you that because I read book three first. <laughs> so I read The Wallflower Wager first because it's her newest book and I'd been sent a review copy of it. Loved it so much that I went on script and found out that they had books one and two on audiobook and listened to those. However, for the sake of reviewing them, I will start with book one. So book one is The Duchess Deal. And basically in this book we follow a young woman who is a seamstress, she was the daughter of a vicar but because of um, a past with her father and a falling out she left home, became a seamstress and she was supposed to <laughs> make the wedding gown for a wedding that is now not going ahead because the uh, bride has left the groom as he's come back from war badly scarred and she has rejected him because of these scars and he's now in search of a new wife because he needs to continue his line because he is a wealthy nobleman and he needs, you know, a uh, heir. So he asks the seamstress to marry him instead and she's like, well, you know what, this is actually quite a good deal. Uh, probably not going to marry anybody else at this rate and I could do with the, um, you know, security. So yeah, so they get married and his suggestion is basically that they will procreate she will get pregnant with his heir and then they will live separately from one another and it will only be a marriage of, and it will very much be a marriage of convenience. She however requires a little bit more and she's like, do you know what, no, we have to have dinner each night together and actually get to know each other a little bit because I'm going to have your baby. So they do that and actually they fall in love, like, <laughs> but it's romance, it's so predictable but that's kind of what's amazing about it, you know, there's moments of tension enough that you get riled up and excited and like, why did you do that and oh I hope it all works out but you know it's going to work out and that's what I needed when I was ill. This one in particular was laugh out loud funny. I just love Tessa Dare's sense of humour and I could not stop laughing throughout this book. If I didn't mention it's set in the 1800s, the war in which our protagonist has come back scarred from is the Napoleonic War. So that's the time period that we're in and I just loved it, like I, I could not stop laughing, I thought both these characters were so well matched, so funny and they do crop up in the other two books occasionally and are still funny in those books. They are just such funny characters and they, yeah they just had me laughing and that was so much fun. One thing I will say however though is the American cover which is the cover that I get when I go on Goodreads although it's not the UK cover shows a man and a woman you know kissing. They're in a relationship. Great. Um, but I find this with a lot of Tessa Dare's covers, um, and I don't blame her by any means, I blame the publisher, is that 
This is a man who is constantly described in this book as being very badly scarred from his time at war and a mis misfire um, on his face and his body and that is not true of the model on the cover and I don't understand how you can have this book that's so like body positive in that respect and sort of like how those things don't matter yet hide it from the cover. That bugs me and I will also say that's true of another book out by Tessa Dare, the one that I finished yesterday in September, but I'll just mention here for the sake of this argument, um, because the female protagonist in that book has a, uh, what are they described as, like a port wine birthmark, but you know, sort of like that kind of red birthmark that covers a large portion of her face. Again, the model is not depicted with that birthmark at all, and I just don't get that. Like, why are we kind of taking those aspects of those characters away from them on the covers of these books. I don't like it, I wish they wouldn't do it. But, moving on to book two, uh, which is the governess game. I think I gave, so yes, I gave the Duchess deal five stars, I gave the governess game four stars, and I gave book three, the Wallflower Wager, five stars. So, the governess game is again about a friend of the woman from the first book, and she ends up becoming the governess of two unruly little girls who are the wards of this uh, nobleman who doesn't really want the responsibility. He was not meant to uh, have as much responsibility but basically all of his other male relatives died in the war so now he's the only one left to deal with it which also makes him in charge of these two little girls and he needs somebody to just, you know, get them behaving before he sends them off to boarding school but of course he falls in love with the governess. <laughs> like again. It's a romance book, we know what's going to happen. So it's about their tumultuous relationship and, you know, finding love in one another. This one reminded me a little bit more of um, A Week to be Wicked by Tessa Dare in that the protagonist is basically like an intellectual. Um, she's painted as like not your normal young lady or at least not the young lady that society expects her to be because, you know, she is a wannabe astronomer. She's fascinated by the stars. She also makes her living not by being a governess until this moment <laughs> but by um, setting clocks so she's you know she's in a way she's a scientist and that me and in some and because of that she reminds me a little bit of Minerva from A Week to Be Wicked who is a geologist so if you like that kind of female protagonist then you'll probably like this one I don't really know what else to say about it I really enjoyed it then there was book three The Wallflower Wager which I actually read first so I think it is already clear that I loved it because it made me want to read more. I think that's obviously the sign of a good book. If I loved it that much that I just then went on a binge, it had to be good, didn't it? And this one is about Lady Penelope, who basically runs a like animal rescue shelter from her house, her like London townhouse. She has never met like an, a stranded animal that she doesn't want to save, and because of that, she has a pet goat a cow, <laughs> cats, um, what else did she have? She had a hedgehog, a dog, an otter, how could I forget about the otter? You know, she has a lot of animals that she's taking care of. And a wealthy man moves in next door and he is basically planning on like doing up the house next door and then selling it off for a profit. But he sees her pets and her animals as, you know, being in the way of his profit making. You know, it's not going to be a very desirable place to move in if next door there's goats roaming about because this is not the countryside. So he makes a deal with Penny that he will find all of her. So he basically tells Penny she has to get rid of her animals and she's actually been told by her aunt that she also has to get rid of her animals. So she enlists his help to get rid of her animals and find them homes. And in the process, they fall in love. Oh my goodness, shock. Who was expecting that? And I loved it. Like, I'm so excited for book four because I love the, the four female characters in these books and I love their friendship and their group and I loved that they all appeared in each other's stories even if I did read them out of order slightly and because of that I cannot wait for book four because it follows the final friend of this foursome and I want to know what her story is and it's been hinted at now in book three and I think it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. So that's everything I read. Um, don't know if those were particularly articulate or intellectual reviews, but I um, reviewed them, so that was good. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you've read any of these books. Would you like dedicated videos on any of the things I kind of mentioned, like 
the Extinction Rebellion book or the Seven Water series. Actually, once I've read a bit more, if you want a dedicated video on Tessa Dare, let me know. Those are all things I would be happy to do, but hopefully in the meantime, I've given you a little bit of an insight into all the things I've been reading, whether I like them, whether I didn't like them, what I liked about them, and whether you might want to read them. So until next time, happy reading, and I'll see you all again soon. Bye guys!